I'm supposed to talk about government dysfunction. Not that we haven't seen any recently, but, uh, you know, I, I, this is the world I came from. Uh, I spent 16 years as a member of Congress. I spent 30 years working in American politics, working in party politics. And then I had a chance to leave and to go off and teach. And I went to Harvard and Princeton, and I had time to do something you don't get to do when you're in Congress. So that's to reflect, to think about what I saw, to think about what worked and what didn't work and why it didn't work. So I wrote a book. And the, the title I came up with, not a very exciting title, but I thought kind of expressed the idea of what I saw, was the parties versus the people. But what got people's attention was uh, the subtitle, which I did not write. Because the book started with an article in the Atlantic magazine. And the editors of the Atlantic put on the article this headline. How to turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. And I, you know, I, I read that and my first thought was, you know, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? And they said, well, did you read what you wrote? Uh, and so, um, so I want to tell you uh, about what I wrote. I actually was giving a talk about this uh, a little while back to the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. And after I got through explaining what I had seen, one of the people in the back of the room got up and he said, oh, you're a systems engineer. And I thought about it. I didn't know what a systems engineer was, but I thought about that. And I realized, yes, it's the system. It's not that we elect people who are dumb or who aren't patriotic. Everybody I served with in Congress, both parties, cared deeply about America. They wanted to do the right thing. So why doesn't it work? Why is the Congress more like the NFL than like a group of Americans sitting down together to look at our problems and try to solve them? So let me tell you about the system that we have created in America that Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison all warned us against repeatedly. Don't create the political party system that we have created. So let me try to give you a couple of examples of how this works in terms of who uh, is sitting in, in Congress and making the decision. You know, one of the things to remember is that in our unique system of government, all the major power of this country is in Congress. It's not in the executive branch. Over war, over spending, over taxing, it matters who serves in Congress and whether or not they are representing the voice of the American people. So a couple of examples of how the American people are being represented. When Joe Biden became vice president of the United States, there was a vacancy for a Senate seat in Delaware, and everybody knew who the next senator would be, Mike Castle, who had been the governor, very popular uh, member of Congress. But he had to go through a primary first. That's what we do. We have party primaries. And a lady named Christine O'Donnell ran against him. And she got 30,000 votes and beat him. His people didn't turn out. They knew he was going to win. She got 30,000 votes in a state of one million people. Mike Castle lost the primary. And so everybody said, well, why didn't he just run in the general election? And beat her then. I'll get to that. State of Utah, you probably are familiar with uh, a senator named Mike Lee, who uh, has played a big role uh, in the partial government shutdown that we had. In Utah, which has not a million people, but three million people, they start with a party convention. And they had a party convention that had had roughly 34, 3,500 people at it. Partisans, ideologues, party activists. And the senator there running for re-election was Senator Robert Bennett, 
very popular. He'd been in the Senate a long time, very well liked in the state. But they had this convention of activists. Mike Lee got roughly 1,200 votes in the second round. 1,200. So he beat Robert Bennett, who came in third, who had 900 and some. Difference a little over 300 votes. That ended Robert Bennett's career. Why? Why didn't he run in the general election when he would have certainly been elected to the Senate and he would not have gone along with the government shutdown? Why? Why did Mike Castle and Robert Bennett not run in the general? Because we have created a political system in which winning a primary is not an endorsement, but it is a system to keep people off the ballot. In 46 of the 50 states, if you run for your party's nomination in a primary or a convention and you don't get it, no no matter how few people participated, you can't run on the ballot. You can't be on the ballot in November. We allow small groups of hyperpartisan ideologues to control access to the ballot and to keep the millions of people in the state from being able to choose who they want to make the decisions about spending and taxing and going to war. You may be familiar with one of the senators from Texas who gets in the news from time to time. Uh, Senator Cruz, in a primary in Texas, got less than 700,000 votes. It's a one-party state. You get the Republican nomination, you pretty well got it made. So he got around 700,000 votes in a state of 26 million people. That's how Senator Cruz got to be Senator Cruz. That alone says that the people who get elected to Congress, House and Senate, are not really represented. We don't know if they represent the people of their communities, their districts, their states. What about redistricting? Tell you about it. The Constitution envisions that whoever is elected is going to be able to be an articulate representative of his or her constituents. You're from there. You have to be from there. You have to be one of them. And they have to know you. And you have to know them. Let me tell you how that really works. In 37 states, whichever party controls the state legislature draws congressional district lines for its own advantage. Just a little personal story. You know, I'm a city guy. I grew up in Oklahoma City. I think I was on a farm once or twice as a visitor. I had no idea what I was looking at. You know, I know nothing about farms. Food comes from a grocery store. Uh, And I I was the first member of my party to get elected to uh, Congress from my district since 1928. My district, I'm a a Republican. My district was 74% Democrat. And so the legislature then, was, which was controlled by the other, both parties do this, by the way. Uh, both are equally bad. Uh, what, what happened was my district was redrawn in order, since they couldn't beat me, I don't know why, my mother certainly didn't understand why they couldn't beat me, but uh, they, they couldn't beat me, and so they decided to put all the other Republicans they could find in my district and take them out of the other districts and make them safer for their party. The result of it was that I, the city guy, was representing wheat farmers and cattle ranchers who under our constitutional system are entitled to be represented by somebody who could speak for their concerns and their interests, and I tried but I couldn't do it as well as they deserved because it served the interests of the party. To heck with the voters, it was about the party. So let me tell you what happens when you get elected to Congress. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually uh, been on the floor of the House. You know, if, if, if TEDx did things like most people do, there would be a lectern here. And everywhere you go and you look at a speech and, and you hear somebody, there's a lectern, right? Not on the House floor, there's not a lectern. There are two lecterns, one for Democrats and one for Republicans. 
the first time I, I was so full of myself, the first time I gave a speech uh, on the House floor, I knew I could persuade the, the Democrats to, to go along. So I stood at their platform and I looked at them, you know, and I started to speak to them and there was this gasp. It was like, you're going to get cooties if you touch the wrong lectern, you know, that belongs to the other party. Uh, you, there are separate cloakrooms, you know, where you can go have a sandwich or read the paper. You don't do that together. Republicans do it in one place, uh, Democrats in the other. The, when I first was sworn in, it was a great kumbaya moment. We're all very happy. We're standing there together uh, and, and getting uh, sworn in together, and we're going to save America. Uh, that lasted for 30 seconds, and then we voted on who would be speaker. All the Democrats voted one way, all the Republicans the other way. You know, we decided the, the ratios on the committees. All the Republicans voted one way, all the Democrats voted the other way. That's the way it was every single day I was in Congress for 16 years, party versus party all the time on everything. We had Republican staff or Democrats. I didn't know Democrats uh, added differently than Republicans do, but apparently you do. So this is the system we've created. It's not in the Constitution. Our founders warned us against it. We have a system that is designed not to represent the American people, but to represent the interests of the parties. You know, so you have speakers of the House, Democrat or Republican, men or women, who are party leaders. They're not legislative leaders. They work on a partisan agenda. So, this sounds to me, and probably sounds to you, like a hell of a downer. I, it isn't. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. In my view, the revolution has already begun. USA Today had an article that said that the American people are fleeing from the political party system. More people are registering as independents than Republicans or Democrats. So here's what happened. In 2006, the people of Washington State looked at what was happening in American government, and they basically said, we had enough of it. And they went to the polls, and they changed their system. They did away with closed party primaries and said, all the candidates run. Everybody who wants to run and is qualified to run, everybody runs, and the voters can choose whoever they want. And they did away with party control of redistricting. That was, that's Washington State in 2006. In 2010, California did it. And California got rid of closed party primaries. And California got rid of party control of redistricting. And there was an article in the New York Times front page last week that in California they are finally passing legislation in a bipartisan way. Look. Our system is supposed to be a constitutional democracy where as long as what is done is within the confines of the Constitution, the will of the people will prevail. We've lost that. Now it's the will of the party leaders that prevails. And it's time for us to put an end to it. It's time for us to turn these political, self-serving clubs, power-seeking clubs, back into groups that they can endorse if they want. Make them like a rotary club. You know, that they, they can endorse if they want, but take away their ability to control access to the ballot and to keep limiting the choices of the American people. Take away from the parties the right to draw congressional district lines the way they want. Create a system where you go to Washington and you sit down regardless of whatever club you belong to and you are Americans in common, working in common to solve the problems that beset us all and that we have to continue to do to pay our bills and to keep the government open and to provide for clean water and clean air. Let's do it. Let's start the revolution. Let's break the back of the political parties and go back to the constitutional democracy our founders intended us to have. Thank you.